Just how helpless a sinner are we? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Seven Ways from Sunday Podcast. I am Larry Stump, your host and brother in Christ. The purpose of our podcast is to edify and equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. And we are trying to do that in this series, beginning uh, beginning to look at the basic cardinal doctrines of the faith. And in our case, we're starting with a tough one, but one that needs to be uh, entertained, one that we need to chew on, think about, digest, and contemplate. And that is the doctrine of sin. Last time, we ended our podcast uh, on, on just a brief look at, a deeper look, but brief look at the universality of sin. And we answered the question, is there anybody that can escape the condemnation of sin? That can say, I've, I've not sinned, I've kept God's law, I've honored God and everything. And the answer to that question, we had a drum roll? Absolutely not. Today, we are going to continue our talk at, topic of sin, the doctrine of sin, and we're going to be discussing just how helpless a sinner we really are. And so I hope you tune in and follow these Bible verses. Take some good notes. We'll need to look back at them. Not only does the Bible represent the unsaved man, you and I, and everybody we know, as a sinner. But it clearly shows us to be helpless. Helpless sinners. Utterly, utterly unable to help ourselves, unable to make ourselves better in God's eyes. Now I know we can practice behavior modification and we can adjust things and fake it to look good to those people around us, especially on social media. But not in God's sight. And, and that's the person and that's the opinion that really only matters in light of all things. We are described as dead in trespasses and sins in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And if that's our case, if as sinners we're dead in our trespasses and sins, surely then we can do nothing for ourselves. Surely then as a dead person spiritually we can do nothing to help ourselves spiritually. Dead people physically can do nothing. So why would we think that means something different when we're talking about our standing before God? We can't. We try to, but we can't. James 2.10. I want to read that with you. And you'll hear fumbling around and stuff as I'm flipping through my Bible to get to these things. And that's okay. That's okay. I hope you're flipping through your Bible too to make sure what I'm telling you is right. But in James chapter 2, verse 10, we read this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. I hope you remember in our last podcast, I said we were going to talk about that a little bit more. And so I'm keeping my word. And it's correct. (laughs) It's just going to be a little bit more. But here in James 2.10, we clearly see that if someone tries to earn salvation by good works, by trying to be a good person, or, or trying to keep the law, He's got to keep every one of God's commands at every point perfectly to fulfill it. And if he doesn't, if that person doesn't, if he violates it in one point, no matter how small that violation may be, he becomes a sinner. And all sinners, all sinners, my friends, need a Savior. There isn't one sinner that will ever be in heaven without a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. So if, if you or I offend at one point, trying to keep the law, no matter how, how uh, anal we are at it, and we offend at one point, that, that one slip of the tongue, that one lustful glance, we're a sinner. We need a Savior. And it's, in God's eye, it's as if we've broken every law at every point. It's not the magnitude it's not the, the volume. One sin makes us a sinner, and as a sinner, 
we need a Savior. Romans 4, 4 and 5, if you look there. Romans 4, verses 4 through 5. Let me read them to you. Tell us this. Now to the one who works, right? this is, this is the person that, that is working, striving hard to earn righteousness. Now to the one who works, Paul says, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but what is due. Right? When I go out and work for somebody, the money I get, it's, it's not a favor. It's not, not kindness. I earned it. And so they pay me. That, that's the contract we have. We, we, it doesn't apply to salvation. That's what Paul's saying. Your wage isn't, you know, you're trying to work for it. You, your wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what's due you. But to the one who does not work, verse 5, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, that person's faith is reckoned or imputed to him as righteousness. It's reckoned as righteousness. What a big difference. What a big difference Paul lays out in those verses. I mean, think about it. If you or I could earn salvation by works, God would owe it to us as a debt. God would owe it to us. And then it wouldn't be of grace. And we know in our Bible it says that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. It's his unearned or unmerited favor that we receive. Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything Christ has done. And you can add to that the fact that since you and I as, as sinners are powerless to earn it either by works or by trying to keep the law, salvation then would be a very scarce commodity, wouldn't it? If we can't earn it, if we can't work for it, where would it come from? Where would we ever see it? We wouldn't if it weren't for God's amazing that's why he says it's given to him that worketh not, but to the one that believeth. Grace and works, according to Romans eleven six, they just don't mix. And Paul says, but if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Can't happen that way, my friends. Grace and works don't mix. Salvation, according to Romans six twenty three, is a free gift, unearned. You can't earn it. It's something God in his grace, and the kind intention of his will, gives to those who trust him. Romans 10.3. Romans 10.3. When we look at how helpless we truly are, Romans 10.3 says this. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. What does that have to do with the topic? Simply this. That verse tells us why men try to argue and reason and excuse themselves. Why perhaps as we got into this topic, you probably might have been arguing or reasoning or trying to excuse yourself, make yourself feel good about these things. right? Talking about the good things you've done or you're not as bad as someone else that you know, comparing yourself with, with others, those kinds of things. But see, what that verse tells us is that they are ignorant of God's holiness and requirements and of the fact that nothing unholy can enter God's presence. They're just ignorant of that. And so, because of their ignorance, they seek to establish their own righteousness. Instead of, of trusting in God for his righteousness that's offered in Jesus Christ, people seek to establish his own. And when they seek to establish his own, their own, Men argue and reason and try to justify and excuse themselves from the issue of the universality of sin and their guilt in it. It's interesting, I can't read it, but in Jeremiah 2.22, we find a contrast between the body and the heart, or, or our, our, you know, our external life versus our internal life, what's going inward. doesn't matter how much water and soap, you know, that you may, may wash the outside of your body with and cleanse it from dirt and make it smell good and stuff like that. You just can't cleanse the heart that way. You can't cleanse the heart and the life from sin, no matter what you try. Many, no matter how many times you bathe yourself after you've done something corrupt and perverse, 
You cannot cleanse your heart from that sin. No matter how long you faithfully apply the soap and the scrubbing. You just can't do it. You can also find things that pertain to that in Titus 3, 5, Matthew 9, 12, and Galatians 2, 16, and also verse 20. So these, these scriptures that I've been sharing with you, they are of extreme value in helping us deal with a sin issue and admitting that we're a sinner or if you're a faithful proclaimer of God's word, helping someone else admit and come to understand that they're a sinner. Right? They may they may have a, a, a worldly sorrow and decide they're going to turn over a new leaf or adjust their behavior in some way, behavior modification, or they're going to make you know a New Year's resolution and they're, they're going to be a better person because they, they have that, that worldly sorrow or they have that embarrassment or shame of getting caught by someone they know and love that they didn't want to know the sins that they did. But people, you and I and our friends and relatives and those in our world need something different. They need something else. They need something more powerful. than behavior modification, than self-help pop psychology, than, than false images of who they are you know, over social media, or something different than, than being depressed and hiding out because of this, this sin. And the underlying issue of what's going on is the universality of sin and a wretched, wicked heart that needs transformed. What they need instead of that is to confess those sins and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They need to repent, the Bible says, and put their faith in Jesus Christ. They need to acknowledge that he is right and they are wrong. They're no longer ignorant. They believe what he says, and they're looking to him and trusting him for his promised forgiveness, for his promised justification, for his righteousness that, that they couldn't earn. It's just a free gift. They, they want that gift. They need that. They need something different. This is something we need to, to, to meditate on for ourselves. Dear Christian, speak to you first. Dear Christian, there's two, peop- two types of people listening to this podcast, a Christian and a non-Christian. And as a Christian, we need to, to listen to these things. And, and the scriptures say, test yourself, examine yourself to see if you're the faith, lest you fail the test. What better way to test ourselves than to, to think through the sin issue and where we're at in our personal walk of faith. Are we still grabbing for sin or are we pursuing Christ? And then if you're listening to this podcast and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, perhaps you're skeptical about these issues. Perhaps you'd say you're an agnostic or, or an atheist or you know whatever. You're just listening to this podcast to find, find ways that you might be able to to jab at me or mock me through comments or things like that. You need to know that, that your guilt and condemnation stands. And you need to seriously consider these things. Not only consider that you're a sinner condemned before a holy God that created you, but how are you? How can you get out of that? Is there a way out? And there is, and that's what I'm sharing with you. And you'll see if you go on, if you keep following this podcast, as we go through all these doctrines, even here, this is the bad news. This is the bad news. But the good news has been mentioned, and the good news will flourish and shine out brighter as we move along over the weeks and months. And that answer to our sin dilemma, to that sickness, is Jesus Christ. And I pray and hope that you'll look for him. Next time we get together, we're going to talk about exactly how the Bible shows us a picture of how we are totally, totally helpless and wretched in sin. The sinner's photograph. Next time. Until then, walk by faith and not by sight.